Jamie, to be able to help us move on to the next parts, would you like to share maybe a practical action item that we can all take away from this, from what we've discussed? Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I think one of the best things you could do is a client manager, it's important for them to do the right type of work. So there's the, what we call the wise traffic quadrant, which just sort mm -hmm. of outlines how the traffic should flow within a team. But it's important that you know, a client manager is doing the right type of work, Thomas. Mm -hmm. So one of the best ways to do that is to document every single task that that client manager is doing. Years ago when I was working with Ed, Ed might recall we were fairly top heavy at Sky going back and I had a couple of <clears throat> up and coming budding client managers and Ed might recall they said, oh, there's, oh, there's no way we can do more than three or four hundred thousand dollars in fees. They just said, Oh, there's no way. <laughs> the most important things that we did was actually sit down, Thomas, and list every single task that those client managers did. Mm. And so in that process, you you actually determine what level of admin that they're doing. And until you get down to the nitty-gritty, you don't really realize how people actually process their work. So what you can often find is that one client managers doing a lot more admin than another one, just in their processes of how they go about actually producing the work. What you ideally want is the lowest cost person doing the easiest or the least complex type of work. There's no point in having the most experienced, you know, most costly person doing the least complex work. So it doesn't work for either of, you know, it might be efficient, but Sometimes I might do the work quickly, but then, you know, often you'll have a paid audience or sometimes characteristics of a client manager is they can be a bit of a control freak as well. Mm. So, you know, and often a client manager is promoted internally. So it's very important for the client manager to know to what work they should be doing and what work they need to let go of, right? <laughs> And don't be a perfectionist or don't be a control freak either. Biggest practical takeaway I could tell anyone is as a client manager, list every single item that you do and then you know work with the wise philosophy around what it is ultimately that you should be doing. So you know whenever you find yourself processing the work or actually doing the work or doing the majority of the work, it's not the right process. <laughs> so... Mm. You know, and obviously that depends on the size of your team. The smaller your team is, the more hats that you wear within that team and the more you'll do. But often a big challenge of it, Thomas, is knowing when to let go. You know, mm -hmm. so you win the next client, you win the next client, you check your capacity planner, do we need to hire, you know, and the other very strategic decision in any team is who you need to hire. So there's really two massive decisions that the owner and the client manager need to work together. And often if you are the client manager and the owner, you know, you're obviously thinking about it yourself, but it's like, who do you need to hire? Is it a finder, minder, a grinder, or a client manager, a senior production manager, or, you know, a senior bookkeeper or whatever. But then knowing when to hire is the other very important aspect that you should use your capacity planner for. And then again, as soon as you hire, you have to delegate. So again, coming back to that wise traffic quadrant like get the right people doing the right type of work and once you do that the team will be humming you know so i think yeah coming back to that practical sense thomas is mm -hmm. is list everything you do and then once you've Physical. listed everything you do you can classify you know whether you should be doing it or not a hundred percent a very simple way of understanding whether someone's abdicating or delegating so managers should delegate not abdicate and a very simple way of knowing whether what they're doing is whether they're doing a task from start to finish. So often the senior client managers will say to you, I don't have enough time to pick the phone up and talk to the clients or return my phone calls. It's mm. because they're doing the wrong kind of work. So they're abdicating, they're not delegating. So what I mean by that is if a manager is doing a task from start to finish, in other words, 100% of that task 
then that mm. person is abdicating, not delegating. Now, if they're delegating properly and they're managing properly, they should only do the last 20% of a task, of any task. So any task that comes on their table, they should delegate it all out and they should only do the last 20%, which is checking it, reviewing it, that kind of stuff. But if mm. they're doing it from start to finish, that's one of the reasons why they don't have capacity is because mm. they're abdicating, they're not delegating the work down. So, you know, I try not to do anything from start to finish. I always get somebody else to start it and then I do the last 20%. That way I can increase my capacity by just doing the last 20%, which is the most important bit, which is checking and reviewing, training, that kind of stuff is the most important thing. So that's a mm-hmm. good way to explain, because the biggest challenge you're going to have is when a senior client manager says to you, like Jamie said, when I first worked with him, his senior client manager said that there was no more capacity, you know, that, and yet they were only handling 300 grand. And I said to them, well, my senior client managers handle a million dollars. So you're handling 300 and you're at full capacity. And, mm. and then how's it different? And then, of course, their response was, oh, you've got different types of clients. And, you know, it's all excuses. <laughs> but it was just came down to they weren't delegating. They were abdicating because for whatever reason, they could be control freaks. They think that you can't do it unless you do it yourself. By the time I trained this person, I could have just done it myself. Whatever the thinking was that made them do a task from start to finish was the reason why they didn't have capacity. And as soon as we started getting them thinking the right way and then delegating effectively, then the capacity went up. So today they're mm. doing a million dollars because they, they got out of it. They are delegating. They're not abdicating. They're delegating. They're pushing the work down and only doing the last 20%. But as you said, Thomas, we all grew up as grinders. We're not taught to mm. delegate. We're not taught to manage. Mm. We're just taught to do the work. So when you put someone in a leadership role, such as a client manager, they're going to do that. They're going to gravitate back to control and doing everything. And then you're going to get this pushback from them about, you know, they don't have enough time and, and, and you know, I haven't got time to do this and that. It's because they're not delegating. That is the 100% does, uh, Ed and Jamie. Basically, client managers and owners do your quad activities because don't just go, I need to do- delegate my communications because if you lump it all in your head like that, everything seems like high level. You need to stratify it between high level and low level communication, high level and low level production. If you just go, I'm going to delegate emails now. And what type of emails? Proposal emails, information emails. Some of them are production. Not all of them. I was talking to a firm today and he said out of 50 emails he gets, maybe two are actually important. So that has to be SOP'd and go off your plate because that's where the time suck is coming from. Yeah, thank you. See you in the next one.